Week six, March 7 to 13th, Business 630 Corporate Finance. This is our lecture for the week of March of week number six, financial statement analysis and funding expansion. We're going to talk about two things this evening. I have a, a checklist and I want to go over some key points for the electrics case, which I'll go over also again next week. I've also posted tonight a, uh, a review session that we're going to have on Saturday, March 19th, where you can come with questions and review problems, or review questions in regards to the electrics case uh, for that Saturday. And I will be recording that also, and I will uh, post that along with my introduction letter to this court uh, lecture video this week six. We're gonna also talk about financial statement analysis and funding expansion. You know, now that we've learned about uh, stocks and bonds and the ways of getting capital, we've learned about asset investment and how to retort, record a return analysis. We've learned about capital budgeting analysis, determining the cash flow generated off an asset, and do a, and also have studied risk analysis. These are all things you did in case number three, which was due and posted uh, yesterday, Sunday, March six. Uh, and I will be doing those grades uh, this week leading up to our review session on Thursday, our student hours on Thursday. Sorry about the phone number. And so also, so we'll be talking about that. I have a very good spreadsheet talking about key points of financial statement analysis and also talking about forecasting requirements. How can I forecast? Once we have a capital investment, we've done a capital budget, and then now the capital budget or the asset goes live and is now generating returns, how do we, we, how do we understand what those returns are in the financial statements? And also, how can we forecast based on those returns additional capital needs for our business? And there's all kinds of models out there to use this. We're going to concentrate on perhaps the simplest model, but also the one that's used most the additional funds needed model. And we're gonna talk about that model mainly in our Friday weekend video this week, if, but if we, I'll introduce it tonight so you can see it. So that's our study for this week, all leading up to next week, week seven, when I give you your case number four, which is due on March 20th, where you'll be looking at financial statements and financial requirements for a company, your company that you've been looking at throughout this course, and that will be case number four. You'll be putting that in a PowerPoint format and presentation. You don't have to give the presentation, but you do have to produce a PowerPoint formatted file answering the questions of case number four. But more on that next week. So let's talk about the electrics case. Again, the electrics case is a case that you all have to do that's a requirement of this course, which combines a capital budget number crunching, for lack of a better word, analysis, and an interpretation of that analysis in your findings. So there's two key sections of it. The first section, which is the capital budget analysis and the data given, we'll talk about that in a minute. The second section is the paper. And the paper, you have to answer these eight questions <coughs> in your paper format. And I explained that in my introductory or in my video weekend video last weekend. We'll more talk more about the paper uh, at another time. Tonight, I want to concentrate on the financial data, beginning with the exhibits. And this is here to assess your ability to understand the information given and apply it to a capital budget analysis very similar to what you did in case number three. It requires thinking. It doesn't, it's not a cut and paste. Oh, I'm just gonna copy case number three template and there I go. Well, you can do that and use it, yes. But what is the information given to you in this case and how to interpret it? That's why I've, I've put together a checklist, a series of data, a series of items that you have to find and check off and they all accumulate 
into your capital budget analysis. A couple of things to note in this checklist, and let's take a look at this checklist now. This checklist is located in the biz, in the assessment case file folder that I set up last week. So if you click on that, there's the files that you can download and interpret and read the case. And I hope you've many of you have already done that. And here's the checklist. These are the things you have to find out in order to do this work. Some of them are quite easy, explained very simply in the case. Others require a little thinking and a lot of interpretation. And that's why you're in MBA school, to be able to figure that one out. Now, naturally, the good thing about all this is as you get this information, <coughs> you're more than welcome to send it to me or let me know what you're finding, and I'll let you know that you're on the right track. You can put together drafts of the information. You can put together the capital budget analysis, and I will let you know that you're on the right track. That, that's the important thing. I don't want you to work all this and end up doing it wrong, and then you're writing a paper, and then you're defeating the whole purpose of the interpretation. So I want you to get it right, the analysis. So you're more than welcome to check with me the figures and the information. <coughs> the first one is you have to determine the WAC. You have to determine the weighted average cost of capital. And right off the bat, it's a challenge because the challenge is determining the capital structure of the company. In the past, we've been told, oh, the capital structure is 70% debt. So it must be 70% debt and 30% equity, or it's 50% debt. So it must be 50% equity. In this case, it's given to you a little differently. And all you have to do is put on your thinking cap. The capital structure in this case is told as debt to equity is 50%, 0.5. Debt to equity, not debt to assets, 50%. Debt to equity relationship is 50%. Well, knowing that the debt is 50% of equity, you could very easily calculate what debt is as a percent of assets. Remember, assets is on the other side of the equation. I'm giving you the right side of the equation where the relationship is debt is 50% of equity. Once you determine that, you can determine, naturally, the percent of capital structure and equity. But it's not 50-50. Far from it. The relationship to debt to equity is 50%, but that is not the relationship of debt to assets. Right off the bat, that's something you have to work on quickly because that's the very top of our checklist. Once you have the capital structure, the data provides pretty easy interpretation of how to determine the after-tax cost of debt and the cost of equity, and we've done this before. Then I go down through the project life, depreciation. Now, the depreciation in this case is a little bit different, as I mentioned the other day. It's marginal accelerated cost recovery. You can look that up very easily. If you have a textbook, there's a page in your textbook, but remember the textbook is, is volunteer in this class, but you can just go to Google and type in MACRS and it will give you the tables for this type of asset you have in this problem. How do I know what type of asset you have in this problem? The years of life of the asset in this problem. That's the next key area to figure out, the depreciation schedule. Salvage. And then once you have all that information, you can start beginning to prepare the average base capital budget analysis and put together the cash flow analysis, just like you did in case number three. The only problem in this case, here's problem number three that you got to solve, is warranty cost. You're given fixed cost, you're given manufacturing costs or variable cost per unit, you're given fixed cost in SGNA. But there's a second line of variable costs called warranty. Remember, this case is you're putting together an electric converter 
to convert a car engine to electric power. There's the motor and the converter. Each one has a warranty. The warranty is given to you in the problem where, well, let's, let's go to that. Let's show that. Let's show where it is in the case description. Here in exhibit one and exhibit two. In exhibit one, they give you the motor cost. <clears throat> in exhibit two, they give you the controller cost. The combination of motor and controller is the total cost structure of this product. And you have two products to choose from, CTX-13 and MT-78. You're gonna use the average base case analysis right off the bat, where there's 40,500 units produced every year at a total selling price per unit of $9,200. The labor cost is $4,250 per unit for all three scenarios. So use that for average. The parts is $2,500 per unit. Those are all, add those two together, there's your variable cost. S, G and A, administrative selling and general administrative expense is $9.5 million per year. That's the fixed cost. Variable, fixed. In the controller cost, you also have another variable cost, the price of the controller. $1,280 per unit. For the other product, it's $1,260 per unit. You add this $1,280 to the other two costs per unit, and that's your total variable cost. So variable cost, variable cost, fixed cost. Now we have another variable cost that you will keep separate. And it's called warranty. And I'm sure a lot of you have had seen warranties in your life. You buy a product and they say, well, if you if this product fails within a certain amount of time or a certain level of use, you can get your money back or it fixed. Well, the same thing holds true with this electric motor and controller unit that they're trying to put together in their business model. The motor has a warranty of five years. In other words, you purchase it, I mean, you produce it and sell it in 2022. If somebody brings that back by 2027, they get their money back or get it fixed. Now, what is the company's estimate for what that warranty is going to cost? Well, the warranty on the motor is $75 a year for those five years. $75 for each year for five years for the life of the warranty. Now, here's the mystery. How am I going to put into my analysis $75 a year for five years? Well, as it says here in the case, the present value of this cost, $75 a year for five years, will be the cost figure for each electric motor. In other words, you do a present value analysis of those five years going out in the future of $75 a year. And what is that in today's dollars present value? And that will be your cost of the warranty per unit for every year, because every year of this project, you're producing a unit that's going to have a warranty, a five-year warranty. So that's why you do the present value, because you can lump all those costs into one amount, and that's your allocation for the cost in your analysis. So there's two warranties, one for five years on the motor for $75 a year, and for the CTX controller, the warranty is also five years at $90 a year. So for this particular product, it's $165. 75 plus 90 every year for five years. So you're going to take that $165 and discount it back to determine its present value. And that will be your warranty cost for every year, for every unit in your analysis. Same thing holds true with the analysis for the MT-78. $75 warranty for the motor for five years. But in this one, it's $100 for 
per year for five years. So that's $175 every year for five years that you're going to discount back that five years of cash expense into one number. So now you're following the accounting principle of matching expenses with the revenues of putting the product together. You produce the product in 2022, all the costs and expenses associated with that product are gonna be in your analysis along with the selling price of $9,200 when you sell it in that year. We're not dealing with any inventory here. So how do you match expenses with the, in that year that you're producing it and selling it? You use the present value to take those $165 a year cost for five years or $175 a year cost for five years. You got to use your thinking caps on this. So you're going to have another variable cost line just for warranty. Keep that separate because it's a different type of calculation. What's your discount rate? It's your cost of capital. Okay. Remember, the life of this project is eight years. It's an eight year project. So you're gonna have five years of warranty every year for eight years. And it'll be the same amount every year. Every unit and to build in 2023 is gonna have a five year warranty. Every unit built in 2024 is gonna have a five year warranty. So you can calculate that warranty cost by doing the present value of those costs into one number and allocate it in that appropriate year. It's the same amount every year. That's the third area of concern and calculation for this project. Now we're back to our checklist again. So you got to figure out the capital structure. You got to figure out the depreciation. You got to figure out the warranty. Everything else is what you've done in case number three. The return analysis of taking those, determining those yearly cash flows, using working capital. There's no salvage value in this case. You don't have to worry about that. And then you have to do a scenario analysis based on the three levels of units and selling price that's given in the case, a scenario analysis and a sensitivity analysis with the variables of the two variables of sensitivity given to you in the case. So you're gonna set up a spreadsheet file as your analytical file, your Excel file for this with the tabs for weighted average cost of capital, a tab for your warranty calculation, a tab for your depreciation schedule, a tab for your average base case analysis for one product and for the other, a tab for scenario analysis, a tab for sensitivity analysis. This is what your spreadsheet should look like. And once you get all that done, then you can interpret what the data tells you. And that'll be a subject of another video on another day. But you should begin to be going through and using this checklist one after another and find these variety of things. And we will talk about these again. But the three key areas that are new to you that require some thinking is determining the capital structure percentages, figuring out your depreciation schedule, and this warranty cost with five years of costs discounted into a present value in your analysis. So follow this checklist and begin to look at this work. Remember this work is due on Sunday, March 27th, and there can be no extension on the electrics case. The 27th is the last day of our course. I have to have the grades in to the registrar on March 29th, so you can get them. So there's no extensions. So you need to start thinking about this now, especially this week, because you don't have any other work this week except getting up to speed with the reading and the interpretation that's provided for you in week six here in Blackboard. You got another case to do next week on the side also, 
where it gets a little bit more time consumed. But this is a good week to start interpreting and reading the case and understanding what you have to do by looking at this checklist and beginning to put these pieces of the puzzle together. And remember, you have to think. It's just not a template answer. You've got to interpret some of this data. And I've given you the big three, the capital structure, the depreciation schedule, and the warranty cost. Everything else you've seen before. OK. Now, if you go to week six in your file folder, you'll see our agenda. You'll see an introduction and some information there. A nice video explaining financial ratios. Some additional articles that I'd like you to read. Restoring trust after the bubble and a model for effective financial analysis. I'd like you to read those two articles this week in addition to studying this file that's located in your week six lecture review file. Download that because it's looking at these five areas that you need to be familiar with in regards to this course and financial statement analysis. In the week six in-class review spreadsheet that I've provided is this file in an Excel format, which pretty well defines for our corporate finance the key areas of financial statement analysis. And a lot of you have seen many of these before. You've taken other finance or management courses or from the old accounting days or whatever. But I wanna run through it and then we'll talk more about it in my Friday weekend update video. And also we're gonna talk a little bit more about it even next week in week number seven. Here's a financial statement of a real world company. Naturally, I've changed the numbers a little bit to make them a little bit more manageable because as you know, in most corporate financial statements, as you see in your companies that you've selected this session, the numbers are in billions and million, hundreds of millions of dollars. So I've shrank these just for the sake of, of helping us understand. And here's a company's financial statements for the periods of 2020 and 2021, year ending December 31st. Their balance sheet and their income statement. As we all know, the balance sheet is a statement on a given day, December 31st, their positions of assets, short-term and long-term, liabilities, short-term and long-term, and equity positions, common stock and retained earnings. This company at December 31st, 2021 had $3.5 million in assets and $3.5 million in debt and equity. Their books are balanced. The income statement is for a period of time, probably 12 months of fiscal year, ending December 31st, 2021, which defines for the period of time their sales generated from their business the expenses of doing business, cost of goods sold, other expenses, depreciation, which then creates what is called operating income, earnings before interest and taxes, EBIT. That's called operating profit. Another name for that could almost be called gross profit. Then you have the other expenses of the company, interest expense, and then taxations. Taxations coming determined by subtracting interest from operating profit to get your earnings before taxes, taking 40% of that, and there's their net income. They made a profit in 2021, they lost money in 2020. Then in regards to their stock position, this is their dividend payout in both those years. They paid out 11 cents a share in dividends in 2020 to their shareholders, and they paid out 22 cents a share to their shareholders in 2021. How many dividends did they pay out? Well, here's the number of shares. There were 100,000 shares outstanding in 2020 and 250,000 shares outstanding in 2021. Looks like they issued 150,000 more shares of stock in the market. Those are the big two, balance sheet and income statement. But then there's the cash flow statement, and here's their cash flow statement. 
The cash flow statement is a little bit more complicated, but it, for corporate finance managers, it's the most important financial statement. Why? It tells us where the cash came from, where the cash came from. It either came from operations, financing, or investing. And notice in the cash flow statement, the cash flow statement shows that cash changed in 2021 by $6,718. Well, if I go to the balance sheet and look at the cash balances from 2020 to 2021, it changed by $6,718. How this cash flow statement shows that is by breaking down the deltas of all your accounts, the change in the accounts from one year to the next, that works, that's what makes up the cash flow statement. Your operating cash flows are in red here. Short-term investments and so on. The cash flow statement is operations, which made up of net income, depreciation, change in accounts receivable, change in inventory, change in accounts payable, change in accruals. These four here are called operating assets and operating liabilities. Those are how they changed in the last year. The net effect, negative cash flow from operations. Not good. The financing came from the change in debt and common stock in the last year. Notes payable delta, long-term bond delta, and you'll see these here in the financials. There's notes payable. A delta, it went down 420,000. Long-term bonds went down 500,000. We're paying off the debt. That means cash is being used negative. The big one in this problem, in this company's for 2021, is what we just talked about. Notice we said that their year's stock outstanding went from 100,000 shares to 100 to 250,000 shares in 2021. That's a gain of 150,000 shares. Where is that money? Right here. Common stock on the balance sheet. It went from 460,000 par value to a million 680. That's a $1,220,936 increase in cash flow by issuing another 150,000 shares in the market. And that shows on the cash flow statement as positive cash flow under financing. We paid out a dividend rate of 22 cents a share on those 250,000 shares of stock. That's $55,000 going out to the shareholders for dividends. So in financing, we paid off some debt, we brought in some cash flow from issuing stock, and we paid out some dividends, positive cash flow, 245,936. Investing, where did we invest our money? In two areas, short-term investments. I should put this here in green, I apologize. Let's change that right now. Here it is right there. We invested $51,632 in short-term investments. That might be a money market fund or some type of investments where we're stashing, stashing some cash to earn a little interest. And we're investing in fixed assets. We invested $17,000, $17,050 in an increase in our fixed assets. We bought some more equipment. We bought some new computers. What We didn't buy much but we increased our fixed assets, our plant and equipment as a delta of 17,000. That's cash going out. So on our cash flow statement, we invested in some short-term investments. We bought some new equipment, $68,682 of cash went out for investing. The net effect of all those three areas, negative operations, Positive financing, negative investing is $6,718. You did it right. This number should match the delta 
in the cash and cash equivalents accounts of 6,718. It does. You know they did their accounting correctly because everything balances. The cash, the deltas in cash plus or minus net out to the $6,718. That's the third cash flow statement of a company. And for corporate finance people, as I said earlier, financial managers, this is the most important one. I like to call it, it's like opening up the hood on a company. When you open up the hood of a car, you get a chance to see the engine that nobody usually can see. And you can see if the engine's clean. Does it sound like it's running well? It's looking at the operations or the guts of the car. You can see the outside that it's clean or dirty or dented or whatever. But to really see how the car is running, you got to look under the hood. Well, the cash flow statement is looking under the hood for a company. In case number four, next week, you'll be looking under the hood of the company that you selected this spring term and answering me some questions in a PowerPoint presentation, looking at their financial statements like we're doing today. Another area that you're not going to be assessed at, I'm not gonna ask you any questions on, but I wanna let you know what it's all about because it's very important for every student of business to understand free cash flow. The cash flow generated by the operations of the business that's left over to be used outside of the company. In other words, are they generating enough cash flow from the operations of the business? to generate and use outside of the company. Now, what is the definition of outside the company? Paying interest on debt, paying dividends, paying off debt, issuing stock or selling stock and making short-term investments. Those are the entities of management going outside of the company. What's going on inside of the company is the operations of the business in two areas, basically three areas. One, operating profit, EBIT times one minus the company's tax rate. How much are they making after ta taxes in operations? And then the working capital management, the delta between operating assets and liabilities from one year to the next. This company used $550,838 of additional cash because that was the delta between current assets, current liabilities from one year to the next. And the long-term operating capital is the change in the operating long-term assets of the company, which includes the gross fixed assets or the property plan and equipment, less any depreciation that has been paid out. And in this case, in this company, remember they only paid out $17,050 in additional asset buys, but they had a depreciation expense of $120,000. So in other words, if we are looking at the free cash flow of long-term capital, they generated $102,950 of cash because the depreciation is a non-cash expense. That's the difference between 120,000 and 1750 is 102,950. Cash coming in, cash going out, cash coming in, the net effect, negative free cash flow of 146,304. In other words, this company generated negative cash for the operations outside of the business. They had to pay interest expense. They had to pay dividends. They paid off 920,000 of debt. They bought some short-term investments. But what they did do is issue more stock to generate cash coming in. The net effect of these outside entities is 146,304. So you know you did this free cash flow analysis correctly because the cash created by operations matches the cash going outside of the company. It's important to know this 
But you, again, I'm not going to assess you anything about free cash flow. Don't, don't worry about that. But free cash flow is what Warren Buffett and what major investors use as a determinant of whether they should invest in a company or not. Are they generating enough cash from their operations to invest and use elsewhere? That means usually the company is undervalued in the market and they have a good cash flow system and it's good to invest in them. This company would not be one of those. So you look at a trend analysis over a period of time, what's their free cash flow, flow position? This is the definition of free cash flow. Another area of concerns besides the big three financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, and cash flow statement, is also the statement analysis. And I've given you six key ones that I want you to be aware of. But here's an important thing. Let me go here. I'm going to stop here and then I'll be right back to show you something that's in regard to the statement analysis. Also in week six, besides the uh, lecture spreadsheet that I was just showing you, is in week six introduction, there's these two files and pay attention to page 120, chapter three PDF and download that. And this is what that file looks like. It, it gives the key definitions and formulas for the key financial ratios used in financial analysis. <coughs> Profitability, asset management, liquidity, debt management. These are the key areas and also profitability. These are the key areas and key formulas used in what is called trend analysis, comparing your business to the industry, to your competitors, comparing or showing your business in trends analysis. How has your profit margin changed over the last five years? These are key analytical numbers used in corporation and corporate finance to judge how you are doing. These, this page you should download because it gives you the definitions of all of these and how to calculate them of these key figures. But going back to that spreadsheet, here are the ones you just have to worry about because I'm gonna ask you to find these of your company and put them in a PowerPoint slide in case number four. The current ratio, the liquidity ratio, current assets divided by current liabilities, the debt ratio, how much debt does the company have, current lib or total liabilities divided by total assets. A key figure in profitability is profit margin on sales, net income divided by sales of the company. Another one is return on total assets. These are all described in that handout that I, or that file I just showed you. Net income divided by the assets of the company. I'll skip down to earnings per share. Net income divided by the amount of common shares of stock outstanding. And then the price earnings ratio, which is the stock price in the market <clears throat> divided by the earnings per share. These are six key analytical numbers that companies track of themselves over time and compare themselves to the industry they're in. How are they doing? So financial statement analysis is internal and external, showing the balance sheet, the income statement, and the statement of cash flow. But it's also a trend analysis using key analytical ratios and percentages of comparing the past and comparing your company's financials to the industry and market that they're in. That's what this is. What I would like you to do is try to find 2021's figures in this spreadsheet. What is the current ratio for 2021? Here's the current ratio for 2020, and you see the formula there. 
go to the financial statements if you want to. I'd like you to, because you're going to do this with your company. Go to the financial statements and find this data in the financials and determine it right here. That would be a good practice for you to see how that works. And I'll review this on my weekend update video and show you how I come, came up with the numbers. But you use the data from the financials to do an analytical analysis. So try to do that. It's good to know. And know these definitions and what they represent. In the financial ratio video, it explains these. The final tab in this week six lecture is capital forecasting. It's called the AFN analysis. Taking existing historical financial data and projecting what is gonna happen in the future based on a predetermined activity. In this case, 15% increase in sales. How much additional capital will I need to generate a change in my business of 15% increase in sales. I'm gonna to have to buy additional assets. How am I gonna fund those assets is what I'm trying to determine here. Now you're not going to have a, this is not going to be part of your chapter or case four PowerPoint analysis, but it's going, there's gonna be a couple of questions on the PowerPoint analysis that kind of relates to this, but you're, gonna have to, you're not gonna have to do the calculation, but the, knowing the definition of financial forecasting is a key. And here's the key right here. The sources of financing for a company as we've talked all along in this course are debt, equity, and profits. Well, of that debt, equity, and profits, some of them are externally generated outside of the business, and some are internally generated inside the business that the business has control of. The internal sources of capital are current operating liabilities. It's called working capital. By increasing sales or increasing volume of your business, you're going to use more credit with your vendors. You're gonna borrow accounts payable, which means, right, you have to pay it off in 30 days, but you're gonna generate additional operating debt. No interest on that debt. You gotta have cash flow to pay it off, but you're generating that by the operations of your business. Another internal source is naturally the profits. You get to keep the profits that you make. That's another source of capital. And the two key areas of these financial sources is cheap. There's no cost. There's no interest. If you pay your liabilities or AP within 30 days, no fees. Profits are cheap. You don't have to use any money for that. You're making the money. And that leads us into the external sources and most expensive sources of capital going to a bank or issuing bonds where you have a payment schedule and you have to pay interest. And the most expensive form of capital fundraising, issuance of stock. Because when you issue stock, you have to perform in two areas. You have to provide dividend income or cash flow to your shareholders at the same time, create value and wealth in the company, which will increase the value of your stock price in the market by your performance as, as a company. Very expensive. That's why companies, most companies, if they can afford it, are gonna have their financial capital funded by internal sources, short-term debt with no interest, and the profits that they're generating from maybe even prior periods. But as most of us know, most debt, excuse me, most capital from companies is created by borrowing long-term in the market, either through bonds or bank loans and issuance of stock. And you use the company's collateral and reputation to generate hopefully the cheapest form of those capital items, but they're very expensive though. Understanding that breakdown can give you a determination of how you can generate cheap growth or expensive growth. 
And we'll look at this AFN model on Friday as well. So this week, we're concentrating on the numbers, the history. We've decided to invest our assets. What are those assets generating in return and how, do they, how are they shown in producing <coughs> our financial statements? The balance sheet on a given date in time, the income statement for a period of time, and the cash flow statement for a period of time is how we're generating cash flow. Companies that have attractive financial statements and nice stock prices are companies that create value in their assets and cash flow. The only exception I can see to that off the top of my head is Tesla. Tesla generates very little profits, very little cash flow, but the stock price is high. And that goes back to the age old determination of it's what we think the company can do in the future. And that's why we buy the stock. But for most companies, almost all companies, the value and the return is in the numbers, in the cash flow, in the market value, in the stock price, in the free cash flow. Your job this week is to get to know these things if you don't already know them. Take a look at this financial statement analysis and see what you can do because you're going to be doing the same in case number four for your companies. And on Friday, we'll talk about the AFN or capital forecasting analysis where you're not going to be asked to do this analysis, but you need to understand what it means. In addition to studying this, Remember, you need to focus on beginning to start putting the pieces together of your electrics case. Another form of capital budget analysis, and but in this case, it's also a paper to interpret what you're finding out by answering those eight questions. Please read that this week. If you wait to the last minute, that last week of March 21st to 27th to do this case, you're going to be in serious trouble. Now's the time to get the data together and begin to set it up. Doesn't mean you have to complete it this week, but begin to say, give, save yourself some time down the road and begin to accumulate that checklist to begin putting it together. Look for your case number three solutions and answers later on in this week, because that'll be a template to do the electrics case, but also in the meantime, begin to find those bits and pieces of information on that checklist to move forward and review financial statement analysis. And we'll talk more about this on our weekend video at the end of this week. So that's my lecture this week. I'll be available all week for questions, feedback, and more specifically on Thursday evening. Have a great week, everybody. And we'll see you down the road. Adios.